timing has never been my strong suit. My book came out in March of 2020. And if you think back to what was going on in March 2020, you'll, you'll know why this was bad timing. So uh, two, years, t- two years plus into this book, this is the first public talk I've actually gotten to give in person. So that makes me really happy. I've done a bunch of Zoom things, uh, but the, the pandemic has, uh, has, taken its, uh, has taken its toll. So thank, thanks so much to all of you for turning out and, and to, to you at home uh, for, for tuning in. Uh, A little disclaimer before we get started uh, today, Uh, I I had some trepidation about the subtitle of this book uh, when it was, when I was, uh, when when it was in the formative stages, Uh, and because I know that that L word is, is uh, not a popular word with, with uh, certain people. And I, I just want to, to, to say that this is, not a, uh, this is not a partisan talk today, okay? Whether you think liberalism is a good thing or is an awful thing, it's, it's still nice to, to have some, uh, to, to think about where it comes from. And that's the point, uh, that's really the point of my talk today. What do all of these figures have in common? There's Huey Long, uh, Joseph McCarthy, George Wallace, Ross Perot, remember him? Uh, Howard Dean, Sarah Palin, and we'll continue. Abroad, the late Hugo Chavez of Venezuela, uh, Marine Le Pen of France, uh, uh, Victor Orban of Hungary, Jair Bolsonaro of Brazil? Uh, The answer, of course, is that all of these political figures have been labeled populists. Uh, And and I've had this little exercise. It's been really interesting over the the many years that I've been working on populism, uh, uh, really almost from some of the fairly early days of the Google machine, uh, and that is doing a Google search for the words populist and populism. And when I did that, I most recently did that Google search yesterday, um, the word populism returned about 73 million hits. Uh, for the adjective form of the word populist, Google coughed up 80 million hits. And that, by, by the way, two years ago, those figures were in the 20s, 20 million instead of 70 million. And the growth has been sort of exponential every couple of years since, oh, since the early part of the, of the 20 teens. Uh, so clearly this term, which dates back to the 1890s, is still very much with us today. In fact, I would argue that there are very few terms that are, that are invoked more uh, today in, in, in our political discourse than the word populist. And uh, here's just a sample from all the last few election cycles. Uh, Obama hones populist message in Nevada. All right, Obama's a populist. Biden strokes working, stokes working class populism. That was from his 2012 run for the presidency. Paul Ryan, a populist? Hmm. Um, Mitt Romney's populism. Mitt Romney with his seven houses and the one with the garage, the elevator for his cars, a populist? This raises a question, of course. Has that term been so overused as to be almost meaningless? Uh, Maybe. At the very least, I think we can all agree that it must be an awfully malleable term to be applicable to such a broad range of of public figures. So we'll we'll start today by wrestling with the question of what is populism? Uh, What what does it mean to say that some political figure is a populist or that he or she made a populist appeal to their audience? So here's my, here's my attempt at answering the question, what is populism? First of all, populism 
is, is not a political ideology, okay? But rather, it's a, it's a way that people make political arguments. It's a persuasion, a, a, a political persuasion, as one scholar uh, has put it. Uh, secondly, populists uh, champion the rights and causes of ordinary people against the interests of hostile elites. At least that's, that's the way they couch things. Whether they really do that or not is another question. But that's part of that language, that persuasion of populism. Third, populists challenge not, not, the, not the structure or foundation of government, but rather they argue that the, the, the government has been hijacked by special interests, usually moneyed interests. And finally, it's important to understand in, in today's vernacular of populism that populism can be, a, can, can be a phenomenon of the political right or the political left. Um, and, and it can be used for good or for ill. So, with this definition in our hip pocket, we can see how we end up with some sort of disconcerting things like this, uh, which I, I took from the Vassar College student newspaper. I really like it because here we are. This was from the 20, this was from the from 2020. And here we've got Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, and who's two figures whose politics could, could scarcely be more different than one another, right? And the Venn diagram here in the middle of them, where they overlap, is that they are both they both invoke populism. They both they both have very often been described as populists. Now, this of course still begs the question of where populism came from. And while it's true that, that, uh, that arguments uh, against Washington elites and in favor of the, pe the people go back at least as far as Andrew Jackson, the roots of American populism and, and really the term, it, certainly the term itself, originate surprisingly enough right here in Texas. And in fact, not very far from here in Fort Worth. Uh, in the years after the uh, Civil War. So, I'm going to cut to Lampasas, Texas, 170 miles southwest of Fort Worth. It's the year 1877, and a, a group of small farmers have organized the first chapter of the Texas Farmers Alliance. The alliance was designed to be a farmers' self-help organization, aimed at addressing the dire agricultural depression that had settled over the nation and that had particularly hit southern and southwestern farmers hard. The alliance grew slowly at first, but in the mid-1880s it began to spread like wildfire, eventually enlisting several hundred thousand members nationwide and probably close to 200,000 here in Texas alone. The centerpiece of the Alliance's uh, program was the establishment of farmers' cooperatives. These were member-owned, non-profit stores and gins and, and, and grain mills and crop marketing arrangements. Uh, and I, I constructed this map uh, you, you may not be able to see it from, from where you are, but it, it gives you some idea of, of the extent. These were just the cooperatives in Texas, the, the Alliance cooperatives that I was able to identify. And it, it, it also, uh, there, were, there were Alliance cooperative schools, uh, high schools. Uh, there were leather tanneries, cotton yards, uh, lumber yards, even some manufacturing uh, enterprises. Uh, and farmers really, really viewed the alliance and its cooperative program as, as sort of this is going to be what saves us from, from this horrible depression that, that, never, that, that seemed to just get worse every year. 
The Alliance's crowning achievement was the creation in 1887 of a statewide Alliance exchange. It was the brainchild of the Alliance's uh, president, a man named Charles W. McCune, uh, a Wisconsin-born medical doctor and lawyer. He was, a, he was both a doctor and a lawyer and a newspaper publisher and a farmer. He was a kind of a Renaissance man, fascinating figure. And, and McCune came up with this idea of a statewide alliance exchange which would collectively market the crop of, of all of the state's alliance members um, and, and do bulk purchasing, really wholesale purchasing of equipment and supplies that members needed at wholesale prices. Most importantly, it would, it would uh, extend credit to the farmers using their pledged crops as collateral. The exchange built a state-of-the-art headquarters and warehouse in downtown Dallas. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, I was, I've been asked to let the Zoom audience at home know that uh, we're aware that the chat got turned off, but we'll turn it on for the question and answer. So bear with us. And the Alliance Exchange opened in Dallas in 1887 amid much fanfare. Uh, Texas farmers trumpeted their impending liberation from the ruthless merchants and cotton buyers and other middlemen uh, who, who robbed them of their hard-earned profits through monopolistic practices. But their elation was short-lived. The, the exchange itself needed credit to operate, and bankers and cotton merchants refused to extend that credit. Before the end of its second year, the exchange had collapsed. Many of the local alliance cooperatives likewise failed for similar reasons. reasons. So by 1890, the Farmers Alliance stood at a crossroads. Alliance folk had always talked politics in their monthly meetings. But officially, the organization was non-political and non-partisan. There, there were alliance chapters in, in, every, in every county and, and, and local neighborhood chapters called sub-alliances. So there were hundreds and hundreds of these, of these local chapters. And, but, but while they talked politics, the alliance itself was officially a non-political, well, a non-partisan uh, organization. It was, it was political, but nonpartisan. In other words, it talked about policy, but it didn't support any party. Uh, in, the, in really the finest American tradition, farmers had been taught that they should help themselves, right? That, that, and that was really what the alliance was all about, sort of farmers pulling themselves up by their bootstraps, not relying on government uh, to solve their problems. But in the aftermath of the collapse of the state exchange and of, the, and, and of most of the, of the local cooperatives, Alliance men came to the conclusion that self-help had failed, that in a modern economy, uh, there were certain problems that were beyond, uh, that were beyond the, the ability of, of, of private uh, solutions to, to solve. Once again, Charles McCune uh, uh, proposed a new, uh, a new solution. Uh, it, the, the solution was something he called the sub-treasury plan, and it called upon the federal government to build a network of warehouses uh, across the country where farmers could deposit and store their staple crops, crops like cotton and wheat, and use the crops as collateral for low-interest government loans. The loans would be paid out in, in, in paper money, uh, popularly known as greenbacks, uh, effectively taking the nation off the gold standard. These greenbacks would not be backed up by gold in a, in a vault somewhere. Farmers rightly blamed the gold standard for the tight money and the skyrocketing interest rates that farmers were, were wrestling with. Uh, 
Also, by putting the federal government in charge of, of issuing money, it would remove the country's financial system from the hands of self-interested private bankers, particularly large bankers on Wall Street like J.P. Morgan, uh, who really effectively controlled the nation's banking uh, system. At the state level, the alliance also called for the creation of a railroad commission to regulate the monopolistic rates charged to farmers by the railroads. Both the sub-treasury plan and the state railroad commission, of course, flew in the face of Texans' professed love of the free market. Now, alliance folk hoped in vain that the Democrats or Republicans or both would take up their cause in Austin and, and Washington. Democratic Governor Jim Hogg did create a state railroad commission, but it was weak and was soon ruled unconstitutional by state courts. As for the sub-treasury plan, well, the, the cries from the leaders of both national parties were, were pretty much unanimous and pretty much what you would have expected. It's socialism. It's communism. It's un-American. Faced with this rejection of their program, the Alliance joined with the nation's leading labor union, the Knights of Labor, and other reform groups, and created their own new third-party political movement, the People's Party. Its supporters were soon dubbed populists, a label that they embraced. By 1892, populists had hammered out a platform calling for sweeping reforms to the nation's economic and political systems. And over the space of several years and, and, and some national conventions, they, they hammered out their national and state conventions. They hammered out a list of, a, a platform, but they, they, they referred to their planks of their platform as demands. Tells you something about how serious they were about it. First of all, they called for a national paper currency. In other words, take the country once and for all off the gold standard and have a modern, flexible system of paper money, uh, the, the so-called greenbacks. Uh, their, their national platform demanded, quote, a national currency, safe, sound, and flex flexible, issued by the general government. Okay? Um, they endorsed, of course, the sub-treasury plan, which we've already talked about. Their platform called for a graduated income, federal income tax, which did not exist at the time, uh, with the idea that the wealthy would shoulder a larger uh, proportion of the tax burden uh, than the poor would. Uh, going a step beyond the idea of just regulating the railroads, the populists called for government ownership of the railroads. That they, wanted the, they wanted the federal government to purchase the major trunk lines, like the major, trans, uh, the major transcontinental railroads, and operate them as essentially public utilities, in some ways anticipating the, the interstate highway system today. Uh, likewise, they called for government ownership of the telephone and telegraph systems. They called for the direct election of U.S. senators by the voters. Uh, senators in those days uh, were elected by the state legislatures. Um, in, uh, and and this, was, this, was, this was widely viewed as a, a, a way to, to fight political corruption. Um, they also called for uh, a, a wide-ranging program of uh, labor rights, particularly they called for the right of, of labor unions to collectively bargain for better wages and working conditions. Texans played a prominent role in fashioning these demands, but in the meantime they also had a state level party uh, to build. And this wasn't as simple as it might sound. At the state party's founding convention in Dallas in 1891, delegates immediately confronted what would be the single most difficult question that they would face, and that was the question of what will we do about African-American voters? Um, we often think of the post-Reconstruction years as an era when blacks were, 
were stripped of political rights and, and power and, and the structures of the Jim Crow system were being constructed. But black Texans still voted in large numbers all the way well up into the 1890s. Their votes mattered. Uh, the chair of that first state populist convention in Dallas, a man named Harrison Sterling Price Ashby, uh, better known by his nickname Stump Ashby, uh, tackled this issue of, of, of African Americans and their place in the movement head on, declaring to the mostly white delegates that, quote, they are in the ditch just like we are. I mean, they, they blacks, are in the ditch just like we whites are. We want to do good to every citizen of the country, and he is a citizen just as much as we are, and the party that acts on that fact will gain the colored vote of the South. Unquote. The party went on to elect two African Americans to the party's state executive committee, the governing body of, of the state party. And blacks had representation on the party's governing body for the remainder of the uh, populist revolt. By 1894, a man named John B. Rayner, the son of a slave mother, born a slave in North Carolina, the son of a slave mother and a white U.S. congressman father, had become one of the party's most famous orators and organizers, working virtually full-time for the populists. The populists brought some un, really unforgettable unforg personalities into political prominence. Their nominee for governor in 1892 and again in 1894, governors were elected every two years in those days, was a man named Thomas L. Nugent, a soft-spoken former state district judge from Fort Worth. Nugent's private life and public record were so spotless that even his opponents could find nothing to criticize about him other than his Swedenborgian religious faith, and the fact that he was sympathetic to women's rights. Uh, the fact that the party's most revered leader, he, was almost, he, was, he, he almost achieved sort of sainthood status among uh, Texas populace. The fact that their most revered leader held unorthodox religious beliefs and advanced uh, views on gender suggests that even if rank-and-file populist voters didn't necessarily share those opinions, they were open-minded open enough to, to not let it uh, be a disqualifier in their leaders. After Nugent's death in 1895, leadership fell to a Dallas attorney named Jerome Kirby, a longtime veteran of independent politics who had probably been cheated out of a congressional seat in the 1894 race in the 6th Congressional District. Um, he lost by 200 votes amid widespread... We hear a lot about fraud. <laughs> Go to the 1890s, you want to see real voter fraud. Um, stolen ballot boxes at gunpoint and missing votes and all kinds of crazy stuff, right? Um, Kirby was a hero to organize labor. He had a devoted following among uh, Dallas's African-American community. As a lawyer, he had argued cases before the United States Supreme Court, so he was no slouch as a lawyer. And his keen intellect and oratorical skills made him a formidable campaigner. But the populist leaders weren't all men. Colorado County uh, plantation owner Betty Gay was one of several prominent female populists. She played a, a high-profile role both in the Farmers Alliance, which also allowed women to be full members, uh, and in the People's Party, fiercely advocating for women's rights in the pages of party newspapers and in their conventions, uh, where populists' approach to women's issues contrasted sharply with that of the major parties, or Democrats and Republicans. Throughout the state, prominent architects and inventors and journalists and doctors and educators joined with farmers and laborers in taking up the populist cause for reform. How did their opponents, their main opponents, of course, the Democrats, respond? Well, naturally by branding them as socialists and communists, but also somewhat incongruously, also by portraying them as sort of 
sort of uh, backward rubes, hicks or, or hillbillies or hayseeds as the common label was uh, back in the day. Calamity howlers was another common label uh, that Democrats and Republicans attached to populists. And you can see here, these are very common stereotypes of, of, of a populist. Now, how would populists have really governed if they'd ever come into power? Well, we get a glimpse by looking at the 1895 state legislature, which included 24 populists. Um, though greatly outnumbered by Democrats, the bills they sponsored speak loudly about their priorities. Not surprisingly, much of their legislation addressed economic issues such as regulating the railroads and other monopolies. They supported numerous labor reforms such as the eight-hour workday. They sought to reform the brutal convict lease system in which the state leased out uh, inmates to private industry. Um, they introduced bills to combat rampant corruption in county governments. They advocated for consumer protection legislation, such as bills requiring periodic audits of savings and loans. They sought to safeguard public health and safety by imposing speed limits on trains nearing intersections at, at, at major, major roads, uh, prohibiting the sale of cigarettes to minors. A lot of radical stuff like that. They tried to increase funding for public education, improve teacher education, and provide uh, textbooks at lower costs uh, to Texas school children. In a bill of enormous uh, importance to African Americans, they called for equal per capita funding for black and white schools. They didn't call for the integration of the public schools, but for equal funding, um, and for the placing of black schools under the control of black trustees. Finally, they advocated for a set of far-reaching political reforms imposing stiff fines for perpetrators of election fraud. They steadfastly voted against the instigation of a poll tax for voting, although Democrats introduced such bills at every single legisla uh, legislative session year after year. All of these measures, I argue, mark Texas populists as pioneers of the political ideology which in the 20th century we would come to call liberalism, a term that was really not in, in general use in the 1890s. Now, what do I mean when I apply this label to them? Well, put most simply, I mean that they believed that in a democracy the people, meaning voters, can and should use their votes to ensure that neither government nor business corruptly abuse their power to the detriment of the people. Populists were no fans of big government for the sake of big government. In fact, many of their reforms were, were intended to restrict uh, the powers that politicians could use uh, to prevent people from li living lives of, of dignity and security. Nor were they opponents of capitalism, although their opponents often charged them with being socialists or worse. In 1894, uh, Thomas Nugent exclaimed that, quote, Capital is the handmaid of labor and the dispenser of blessings to all classes and conditions of humanity. Without capital, oops, where is he? There's Thomas Nugent. Uh, without capital, schools and universities would vanish. Uh, churches cease to exist and organized charities pass away. Taste, culture, and refinement would wither and die as if stricken with a curse. Art and science would disappear forever, unquote. Nugent recognized that the modern corporation was the product of the state, enjoying special privileges such as limited liability for stockholders. But as he very succinctly put it, we are not fighting corporations, we are fighting monopoly. Populists, though, understood that the only real counterbalance to the power of the modern corporation was the power of government, democratically wielded by the voters. Running for Congress in his West Texas district, 1894, and I already put his picture up, uh, a man named, a populist named Charles Jenkins declared, quote, and it's probably my favorite quote from the whole populist uh, 
uh, era. I have never been frightened by that scarecrow strong government. I believe in a government strong enough to protect the lives, liberty, and property of its citizens. Populists repeatedly pointed to the example of the Postal Service. Sound familiar? Uh, as an example of how government power could be used to promote the good of society. Although the post office operated at a deficit, most Americans in the 1890s loved it, viewing it as a necessary public utility. But to populists, the arrival of the modern age simply meant that with the growth of concentrated corporate power, public power needed to be wielded in ways that went just beyond the postal service. As party chairman Stump Ashby, there he is again, um, cogently explained it, quote, with the progress of invention, with machinery destroying the trades and transferring labor to congested centers, with the locomotive displacing the ox cart and electric telegraphy destroying distance and communication, collusion has become the life of trade and in fact of all political economy. Things have so changed that the principles of government which were best adapted a century ago could not possibly be suitable today, unquote. This was a, this was a very modern view of political economy but it was not destined to prevail, at least not yet. Uh, to succeed in our two-party system, the People's Party would need to replace one of the major parties, the Democrats or the Republicans. In 1896, the populists thought this was on the verge of happening. Both of the major parties had repudiated the populists' demands. The economy, national economy hovered on the brink of collapse in the midst of the worst depression in American history up to that time. But when the Democratic National Convention met in Chicago, the unexpected took place. A, congressman, a young congressman named William Jennings Bryan, who had endorsed several of the populist minor platform planks, unexpectedly gained his party's nomination for president. When the populist National Convention met two weeks later, to the great anguish of the 103 Texas delegates to that convention, the populists themselves endorsed the Democrat Bryan, in a maneuver known as fusion. Bryan went on to lose to William McKinley, the Republican, and the People's Party, having surrendered its independent identity by nominating a Democrat, collapsed. Over the next century, as if to add insult to injury, people began to associate the populist label with demagogic appeals to the fears and prejudices of the masses. A fact that would have horrified the original populists. The old saying about history being written by the winners uh, was never so true. Yet, populist ideas survived. Some of these ideas found expression in the reforms of the progressive era. Um, the Federal Reserve System, for example, embodied much of the populist monetary policy program. The direct election of U.S. senators, the progressive income tax, and woman's suffrage were written into the Constitution during the, during the progressive era. Antitrust laws struck blows at corporate monopolies, which populists had preached against so much. Still more echoes of populist liberalism found expression in the New Deal. Federal farm programs reflected some of the ideas of the populist sub-treasury plan. The Wagner Act, also known as the National Labor Relations Act, for the first time gave labor unions meaningful bargaining power. The country effectively event abandoned the gold standard. But the full legacy of populist liberalism would not become apparent until the 1960s, when a Texas-born president, Lyndon Johnson, championed civil rights and voting rights for African Americans, declared a war on poverty, 
and marshaled the power of the federal government to create what he called a great society. When asked about the roots of his political beliefs, Lyndon Johnson recalled his childhood sitting on the front porch of his parents, his grandparents' farmhouse on the Pernalis River, uh, listening to his grandfather, Sam Ely Johnson, talk about his own experiences uh, in the 1890s as a Farmers Alliance lecturer, a member of the Populist State Executive Committee, and a Populist candidate for the state legislature. There's young Lyndon Johnson. Um, LBJ recalled, and this is a quote from LBJ, hearing my grandfather talk about the plight of the tenant farmer, the necessity for the worker to have protection for bargaining, and the need for improvement of our transportation to get the farmer out of the mud, unquote. In Johnson's political world, um, populism had indeed cast a long shadow. Now, not every 20th century liberal could trace his political lineage so directly back to populism as LBJ could, but if you want to locate the roots of American liberalism, the rocky soil of the Texas Hill Country isn't a bad place to start. Thank you. And we've got, we're, I think we've got time for some Q&A, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Do, do we want to take a, a, a question or two from the audience sure. while you work on that? Ahead, yes, ma'am. Thank you for the map mm -hmm. we had earlier. And as I understood it, that was the distribution of the co-ops at that time. Yes. Can you help us envision how the, through the uh, evolution into the People's Party, mm -hmm in terms of strength, how that map might look different than just the location of the co-ops. Is that making sense? You mean, you mean like if we had, if I had given you a political map showing populist voting strength, would it match up with the, with the cooperatives? No, just how would that map look by the time the People's Party oh, really... Oh, the cooperatives. How would it look different? And what I'm really going for here mm -hmm. You say, look at the Texas Hill Country. Mm -hmm. I'm really looking for a picture of how East Texas, Deep East yeah. Texas, the part of Texas that was cotton growing, mm -hmm. Confederate leaning, is like or different yeah. from the western part of the state during that time. Yeah, period. well, okay, so the, the, the People's Party certainly had you know, it had its geographic strongholds and its geographic weak, weak parts, all right? But it's a real complicated, it's a real complicated picture. That, if, you had to, if you had to identify, I guess, the most staunchly populist part of the state, it would be, I, I guess we'd call the Cross Timbers. That region starting west, of, just west of Fort Worth and extending down to the Texas to the Texas Hill Country. That was probably the, that was the birthplace and probably remained the greatest bastion of populism, of populist voting strength. But, um, and there were, there were parts of the poor parts of East Texas. The, I grew up in Delta County, uh, which is Cooper, if anybody knows where that is, between Commerce and Sulphur Springs. Delta County was one of the banner populist counties. It elected populists took over the county and, and ran it for a decade, you know. But, but, but it's all over the place. Nacogdoches County is a populist county, for example. Navarro County, where Corsicana is, was a popular, uh, the populists won Navarro County in 1894. Uh, and the, the Farmers Alliance wasn't always able to, to, to it, it didn't always transfer all its strength to populism. A lot of members of the, when, when the Farmers Alliance went into, went into politics and, and, and founded the Populist Party, there were lots of Farmers Alliance members who had, who had loved the, the cooperative program, but they were, you know, they were not about to leave the, the Democratic Party. 
So, so counties like uh, uh, counties like uh, 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 Collin County, um, uh, uh, Grayson counties, a, a lot of those counties up north of, north of Dallas that were huge Farmers Alliance counties remained Democratic counties. That, the, the populace challenged the Democrats, but they remained Democratic counties. You know, the old saying was, the old saying was, why are you a Democrat, in the 1890s, why are you a Democrat? Well, I'm a Democrat because my, 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 my pappy was one and my grandpappy was one, <laughs> right? And that was kind of the, it was such a traditional thing. And of course, the Democratic Party stood for white supremacy, flat out, you know. Uh, they made no bones about it. <laughs> uh, they made speeches where they said, we are the party of white supremacy, right? And so there were a lot of, there were a lot of people who, a lot of white people who weren't willing to go with that. And there were a lot of black people who refused to turn their back on the Republican Party because that was the party of Lincoln and emancipation. So a lot of it had to do with, a lot of it had to do with, uh, should be back over here on the camp, sorry. A lot of it had to do with, um, with, with local, you know, how well organized uh, the local party were. Uh, if, you had, if you had strong leaders uh, who you know knew what they were doing and and worked hard and were charismatic and all that. Sometimes that was enough to carry a, to, to make the difference in a county going populist or not. So I don't know if that answered your question, but it, it, it's a hard one to answer with a short answer because it's a real complicated. You look at, you look at, at, at elect, election maps of where the populist and I probably should put one in my presentation. It's there's there group of counties down in South Texas and a group of counties in East Texas and some up by the, some up by the Red River and it's a, it's a complicated mosaic. Any other questions? The audience here. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll answer some of the... Uh... Okay, so I've, I've got a, a question. Um, how did the Jim Crow laws impact the populist movement? Well, the first thing that's important to understand is that uh, the, the bulk of, when they say Jim Crow, they're talking about legalized segregation of the races, right? The bulk of, almost all the Jim Crow laws are passed in the aftermath of the populist revolt, okay? There's really only one major segregation law. Well, well public schools were always segregated from the get-go, although there weren't really very many Public schools didn't amount to much until the 20th century in Texas. But uh, the, only, the only Jim Crow law that really amounted anything at the state level was a, a law requiring a separate railroad cars for blacks and whites. It's, it's kind of an outlier. It was passed in 1889. But all throughout the 18... This is the really telling thing. All throughout the 1890s, these laws get proposed by Democrats and get defeated uh, because neither Democrats nor Republic, neither Democrats nor populists were willing to alienate the black vote because blacks are still voting in large, large numbers. Uh, you know, th there weren't a lot of Texas counties where blacks were in the majority of the voters, but they were a large enough minority in many counties and in the state as a whole that if whites were evenly divided, a, a black voting block, a united black voting block could could, could spell the difference. So one of the really, really important sort of takeaways from the populist revolt is it's only after the defeat, the defeat of populism in the aftermath of 1896 that Democrats then start saying, aha, we will start legally separating blacks and whites in all walks of life, in all areas of life, not just schools, not just railroad cars, but in, in all sorts of a public, a public accommodation. And, and we'll take the right to vote away from African Americans uh, through various means, pr primarily through a poll tax in Texas. And we will do that as, a, as an offer to poor whites, okay, that if you'll come back to the Democratic Party, give up on that populist nonsense, come back to the party of the fathers, come back to the Democratic Party, and we will make sure that, you, that no matter how poor you are, no matter how low down or uneducated you are, 
as a white man, you will always be better than, than the highest black. And we will do that through the Jim Crow system and, and disfranchisement. So the, the defeat of populism leads, I, I think, directly to the, to the rise of the, of the formal Jim Crow system. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any more here. Any more questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's fine. Can you recommend a book, the best, mm -hmm. in terms of factual and in-depth, a book on the KKK during the period that you've been talking to us about? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, well, the... The, the, the period that I've been talking about, the KKK kind of doesn't exist, okay? The, the, the Ku Klux Klan comes into being during Reconstruction, right after the, you know, the years right after the Civil War, as the sort of paramilitary arm of the Democratic Party, right? Uh, with, with, the, with, the, with the aim of defeating, Reconstruct, defeating the Republican Party that had come to power right after the Civil War during Reconstruction. Once it had done that job, the KKK really sort of ceases to exist. Political violence was still common, but the Klan as an organization had ceased to exist. The Klan is reborn in 1915 uh, in Georgia, long after, long after the events that I've been talking about. Uh, and it spreads nationwide over the next five years so that by the early 1920s it has millions of members in places like Indiana and Fort Worth and lots of other places. Uh, Fort Worth is a, is, is a banner city for the second Ku Klux Klan. Uh, and uh, let's see, I'm trying, I'm, you, you've asked me, a, you've asked me a, to name a book and I'm, I'm struggling. Um, um, well, there's there's not one there's not really one on Texas, okay? There there are there's there's a book by a man named uh, Thomas Alexander of the Ku Klux Klan in the Southwest, probably the best. It's old, but it's probably the best. Okay, Linda Gordon, my historian wife, comes to my rescue as she often does. Any other questions? Well, again, thank you so much. I've got a, I, I, I'm almost out of books, but I had a handful. If anybody's interested in a, a very long book, everything you never wanted to know about Texas populism, I'd be happy to, to sell you one and sign it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh.